questions as you go along. So let me introduce myself. My name is Peter Scott. I have worked for NASA uh, for a while, uh, many years now, and I have worked on helping them get spacecraft to where they would need to go in navigation, and I've worked on their computer systems. And, and so this, my background is an engineer, and you've been doing a lot of engineering, but I also have developed uh, another career in working with people uh, as a coach primarily, because one of the things I learned, one of the things that's absolutely critical to learn when you're applying AI or any other technology is that you'll be focused as an engineer, as a developer on making your system work, on getting the performance you need out of it. You'll find that there's a, a focus on putting a lot of energy into getting maybe a few percentage more points of performance out of a system. And it looks like that's what you're there for. It looks like that's the whole goal is, can we make it 98% reliable? Can we make it 99% reliable? And, and, and then something will happen that will derail the whole project. And we'll have nothing to do with the engineering but it will have everything to do with how you communicate with each other, with your customers, your managers, people who tell you what to do, the people who pay you, the people who use what you develop. And if you cannot communicate with them, if you cannot see the world from their perspective, then the energy that you have expended on your engineering, the um, effort that you have been through to learn all this amazing technology will, will, will go to waste. So that is a, a, a critical skill to learn in this process is the people skills. Because that's one of the things that AI won't do for us, <laughs> not for a long time, right? That's what we're here for. But if you're developing AI, well, you know the conversation around how it's uh, likely to take jobs from people. A fun fact, by the way, a group of AI researchers decided to predict how long it would be before various professions were automated by AI. And they said things like um, you know, retail sales people 10 years, and drivers 15 years, and things like that. The one category that was out way at the end of that timeline that it predicted it would be 80 years before it would be automated was AI researchers. And, and, and they may well have been right, but I think it also illustrates how when we actually know a profession from the inside, we understand just how hard it is. I will note it's not that easy to automate this. And you're going to be bringing your skills into a world where there is a growing amount of uncertainty, distrust, confusion, and fear about artificial intelligence. Do you have a sense of that? Do you, do you appreciate that? This is what's the, the conversation. You as developers already have a good idea of what it can and can't do, right? You know that much of that fear is unfounded, overblown, driven by sensationalist media, usually with a picture of the Terminator in there, right? And that, um, but that doesn't change the fact that it's out there. This is what I was talking about, about the importance of dealing with a conversation, even when you know better about what the AI can and can't do. If you're dealing with people that are your customers, that are your managers, that form part of the ecology that you are working within, and their beliefs and emotions are driven by this larger conversation narrative that is, is happening in the world, then that's what's behind their thinking. And so that's important 
to understand there. One of the things that, uh, let me see if I can show a slide here. Um, good, no, not that one, this way, there we go. So one of the things that's driving, that, that, that makes it hard, so hard for them, for, for, for people who have been around longer than you have to, to wrap their minds around this artificial intelligence revolution is, and I hope I am now sharing, good, this idea of exponential growth. It's kind of old hat to you, meaning that you're, you are, are living with it, but for people who have been around on the planet a bit longer, this is a, a, a phenomenon that's very hard to understand intuitively. Yes, every biological thing grows exponentially, but not for long. Otherwise your mouse would be the size of a skyscraper, right? It stops growing at some point. But computer performance does not. We have been through more doublings of the performance of computers than any biological entity on the planet goes through. Something like 48 doublings so far since the days of the abacus and the hand crank calculator. And exponential growth looks something like this, right? Over time, things go up on this curve. But we don't intuitively get that when it's applied to things in our environment. What we do instead is we, we tend to draw straight lines in our mind. And it's been observed by Bill Gates that we tend to overestimate what's going to happen in two years and underestimate what's going to happen in 10. And you can see that kind of here in, as explained by exponential growth. That we, we think of progress as being like this, this straight red line. And so for the next two years, it exceeds where the, the actual growth happens because we kind of base it on where we have been up until recently. But by the time you get 10 years out, well, look at where it, it, it is, how far behind we are. And, and, and this is why, well, to draw another analogy with computers and I've been doing this for a while. So my examples go back 10 years to uh, uh, an, an iPhone 3, a Model 3. I still have it because I carry it around to show people, hey, look, I've got this phone. It still works. It's 10 years old, but it actually still works. But this one little computer that I can hold in my hand has more power than everything NASA had at the time of the moon landings. Yes, those were 50 years ago, but... If you've heard people say, oh, our cell phones now have more power than NASA had in the moon lander. No, that's wrong. That moon lander had only about the computing power of a hotel doorknob today. I'm talking about every computer that NASA had in every building, every facility in the, the country. All big mainframes, right? Big steel cabinets, flashing lights. You would cover the field of a stadium with those. And that was 10 years ago. Now there's been growth of a hundred times in the performance of our devices, meaning that there are uh, now your state-of-the-art smartphone would fill the stadium to the rafters with those still cabinets and, and blinking lights. It just doesn't compute. You just can't appreciate that. And here's an example of what exponential growth actually means that might surprise even you, which is that if I tell you, even with your knowledge that exponential growth in computing power means that our computer speeds double every 18 months, our power, computing power for the, the dollar doubles every 18 months. And I tell you, here is a job, a task that's going to take five years of computing power. Now, most people wouldn't do that because that's too long to wait for a return on investment. But let's say it's really important, like protein folding simulation to cure cancer or um, climate modeling 
I mean, it's, it's really important. It's going to take five years of compute time to do this, but you've got to do it. What is your best strategy for doing that? And everyone would say, well, of course, we're going to grab the computers that we have right now, start that job as soon as possible, because the sooner we start, the sooner we, the sooner we finish. But it turns out that's not true. Your best strategy is to wait a year and a half. And the math behind that is this complicated. Because in a year and a half, the computing power will have doubled, which means that it will then take two and a half years instead of five years to compute the result, which means if you wait a year and a half and then start, you'll be finished in four years, a year earlier than if you started now. And that's unintuitive, right? Doesn't make sense, but it's literally as simple as what we're looking at. And, and that's the consequences of the kind of exponential growth that we're in now. So what I do is I speak to lots of different types of people about artificial intelligence. Everything from teenagers, you are my favorite kind of audience, uh, to senior citizens who have retired, engineers, artists, uh, all kinds of people, because they all share the same kind of uncertainty, hopes and fears for where artificial intelligence is going to take us. And we are, we being um, the grown-ups who have um, made this world the way it is right now, uh, unfortunately dumping a large problem in your laps and saying fix it and not dissimilar to climate change, right? You're gonna to have to solve that one as well. So I, I, you may wonder with that kind of track record why you should be listening to any of us, but at least bear with me uh, for, for, for long enough to, to say that you will find that it's, or you, I'm sure you've already seen that artificial intelligence carries with it a lot of issues that we don't have sol solutions for yet. And some of those would be, for instance, let me give a, 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 a couple of, a, of, of quick examples here of, of just those uh, types of issues that we haven't solved that, that surround this. So I'll share again. One of those is accountability in artificial intelligence. Because who would be responsible, for instance, for a self-driving car in an accident if there's no one behind the wheel? Should we hold the car responsible, the driver, the owner of the car, the person who configured the car's configuration because maybe they set it to be too uh, sporty a configuration for the person who was getting in driving it for the first time or should it be the manufacturer of the car the people who developed the system that the uh, that, that the self-driving car is using the third party or the scientists the engineers that uh, configured it for its self-driving operation? Or should it be all the, the cars whose data was used to decide that car's uh, parameters for self-driving? These are the kinds of problems we're going to hand you. And, and the reason I like talking to uh, audiences like yourself is that generally when I talk to older audiences about this, they get scared. Generally, when I talk to audiences like you about this, they get challenged. They, uh, you are excited to be taking on this sort of challenge, which is good because you're gonna to have to solve these kind of things. Um, you are probably very familiar with something called the trolley problem in uh, self-driving vehicles. And that's something that's also going to be uh, a, an issue with 
them. But then there's the questions of, of things like repeatability in artificial intelligence. Can you get the same answer twice in a row? Now, with your engineering and AI, you know about things like gradient descent um, uh, in backpropagation uh, mechanisms and finding local versus global minima. And that the, those processes are stochastic and meaning there's some random elements in, involved in them so that uh, running the same process twice in a row may not yield the same answer if it converges on a different local minimum. That's not an issue for some kinds of applications, but if you are writing an AI that is deciding whether uh, what the appropriate sentencing should be for repeat offenders in uh, the judicial system, well, then it really ought to come up with the same answer every time. And, and, and this is, uh, that's, that's one of the critical issues around artificial intelligence because of, oh, I've been talking about the local versus the global minima. And then <laughs> there's explainability. When AI makes decisions like the, like the one I've been talking about, like deciding whether or not to give someone a loan, like uh, deciding whether or not to pay out an insurance claim, we know that we can train AI to do those jobs as well as humans do. They just copy it. But we don't usually get a good explanation of how. Now, you, you, you know if you've done uh, AI programming on, say, image recognition, tag images, recognize faces. We people cannot explain how to recognize faces, we just can't. But given AI enough examples of it, it can learn how to recognize them as well as we can. Great, how is it doing that? We might like to think that it must have learned it to do it the same way that we have, but you, uh, you especially are aware that it hasn't. It has some elements in common with what we do biologically, you know, like extracting features, edges, things like that. But in other ways, it's very brittle. You can throw invisible noise into the picture and craft it in such a way that it comes up with a completely different answer. That means if you're using a neural network to train on something like insurance, it can come up with the right answer, but it can't tell you why, and you may not be able to know why. Um, and yet explainability, like why did you come up with this, this result, is, is a very difficult problem to describe, to answer. What do we mean by explanations? Um, so these kind of, uh, are the kind of difficult problems. But suppose we take a, another context, like ask a car, why did you turn left there? Well, I might say, my front wheels pivoted for 1800 milliseconds. There you go. Or I reached the intersection. So of course I turned left. I was following my navigation plan, which said to turn left here. None of this is being useful, right? That was the optimal route to my destination. Or you told me to. And, and so all of those are explanations, like you might hear from some really pedantic person who's uh, yanking your chain to use a, 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 an, an idiom. Um, but the, the real context here is, well, why would someone ask that question? Probably because they expected something different. And so the actual answer would be the usual route was blocked by an accident. So I took a different one. We get a sense of how explaining a decision requires, going back to what I was talking about earlier, understanding what's behind someone, a, a, a person's thinking and their communication. One of the, the things that I've studied, now, if I say NLP to all of you, I bet you think natural language processing. And that's what it means. That's what it expands to in AI has another meaning in other places. And one of those is neuro-linguistic programming, which is one of the things I was trained in for working with people. And it has a 
one of the guiding principles in that is very useful for understanding people and it's about understanding communications and it says the meaning of a communication is the response it elicits and now we're talking about communications between people right um and so if you wanted to know well what did a communication mean when i was talking to someone don't reach for the dictionary see what happened as a result because in your communications with people that they it, you've done enough natural language processing right by now to know that what we say to each other and how we interpret that is a very difficult problem to solve it does not unpack neatly into computer code the more you do that the more you will wonder how it is that we're ever able to understand each other at all and neurolinguistic programming provides a framework for improving that communication by observing what response the communication re uh, results in and asking questions and taking other actions to determine just how that landed and and so this is what we do in for instance the difference between google and a reference librarian if you were to go into a library march up to the librarian and bark um, avocado fertilizer they would look at you funny and either say i think you need to leave or ask you a question well what is it you want to know about avocados what does fertilizer have to do with it but this is what we expect google to answer right if we want to know the best fertilizer to put on an avocado tree like my daughter who's age 11 be joining you shortly has has got going upstairs and don't ask me how she does it because nothing i try planting grows but she can make anything grow well so what kind of fertilizer should we put on it well we expect google to to answer that question by just typing in avocado fertilizer and it does amazing job of of answering that but your reference librarian will ask questions to find out what you mean and then understand that you're not talking about fertilizer made from avocados you're not talking about uh, what fertilizer did the egyptians use for growing avocado you're talking about i want to know what kind of fertilizer should i get to put on my avocado tree and i live here and so it's got to deal with this climate and soil and so forth and one of the things that google doesn't do is ask questions it only gives answers uh, right you you ask the question and then it gives an answer but it doesn't come back with a question to say could you clarify what you meant about it by that we don't have a model for for doing that yet uh, but that's one of the things that we'll need built into ai there is a challenge for you make ai conduct an inquiry a conversation to to get clarity what could a model for doing that look like so i'm conscious of our time here and i will uh, I, I want to give some time here for questions i want to put this in a context like i said what i do is uh, i i bridge i build bridges for people one of those bridges is well, those bridges are around artificial intelligence because of how important it is you may have heard andrew ing describe it as the new electricity if you look at the history of electricity and think back to where we were uh, at the time that the electric motor was invented the electric light was invented the dynamo and think well how could they what could they predict well they could predict bigger electric motors and more electric lights and things like that they couldn't predict that this would end up in semiconductors and and smartphones and and computers in your in your pocket but we're saying that ai right now is at the is at that stage the electric motor stage the electrification of industry replacing the steam engine with it and and for something that's going to have that kind of impact what i realized that my job is to do 
is to take my technical background in understanding the technology of artificial intelligence and computers and, and many other things like, like you do, and my experience with understanding the ways in which communications between people do and don't work. Sorry about that, this is not my line. Um, and build those bridges to help people who don't have a technological understanding of AI, but are being affected by all of the news uh, and, and pundits and people going on, on, on the screen and, and, and reports about half the jobs in the world being automated within the next 15 years and to help them understand something that's very complicated. And artificial intelligence is, is growing in so many ways that we, we don't uh, understand or won't understand. And I find that challenging and rewarding uh, in, in, in one of the most important things to be doing right now. So uh, we reached the end of our time, but if there is more, then I will take questions at this point. Or you can answer a question from me and introduce me to you because here I am looking into a screen and all I see is my face. Uh, and if you can show me some of yours or at least tell me who you are and where you're from, that would provide me with uh, a, a nice piece of, of feedback as to the fact that I've not been talking to myself for the last 30 minutes. Shall I pick someone? Uh, sorry, who's behind uh, Elena's that's me. Uh, I'm the marketing manager. Right. Where would you like to go at this point? And uh, did that hopefully address your expectations or would you like me to take it in a different direction? Yes, and I thank you very much. Um, everyone, please write something in a chat uh, or ask your questions. Let me ask you all a question. What do you find to be your biggest challenge and reward with the learning that you are doing with artificial intelligence? Um, well, I have a little question, like, I don't, I'm not sure if it's okay or not, but uh, I'm going to say, like, uh, there's, uh, there always have been a conflict between AI and people, um, because AI is entering, uh, like, so many fields in our life, uh, in our daily life, and maybe um, stealing uh, from people their jobs, and so what do you think about that? Uh, about the challenge that it is what, what do i think about the challenge that it's posing is is that your question yeah, yeah. that's a challenge like actually that ai is facing in our daily life like it's a conflict between people and ai right um well it's a growing one um and ai shows up a lot behind the scenes there are i mean i can talk for between 10 minutes and three days about this one of the things we didn't touch on was what uh, AI does in social media uh, and some of the negative effects. I personally believe that the effects of disinformation constitute a public health threat um, in the way that they uh, affect so many other issues. Uh, 
the US would not have pulled out of Paris Accords if it hadn't been for disinformation on platforms like Facebook. Um, so that if there's a direct effect on climate change, for instance. So that's one of the ways in which um, AI is right now having an effect on an environment. And, and we know partly how that came about. The YouTube recommendation algorithm and the TikTok one and the Facebook one looks at pretty much only one thing, which is what do you spend the most time looking at? And then uses cluster analysis to show you more things like that. And, and, and then it, it figures out, and there was a, something in a study in the Wall Street Journal within the last few weeks with a terrific animation uh, associated with it showing how these algorithms then um, take people down uh, roads, uh, paths of showing them things that are increasingly um, more controversial and extreme in the direction that they were looking at. So it might start out you know, that they, they just see videos of puppies and things, but when they, 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 but what we like looking at in addition to things that are cute are things that make us angry. Those things grab us at our attention. And this is what disinformation does, conspiracy theories do to grab our attention. And people who start looking at those will then by these algorithms be shown things that are even more extreme and make them angrier and pay more attention. And, and, and this is having effects that are only starting to be measured, let alone understood. So I hope Maze that um, is one of the answers to your questions because there are many. <laughs> Thank you. Let me contribute. So you're, I imagine that because you're learning AI, a lot of you are going to be uh, looking for positions as engineers and in, um, in, in some business where you can exercise that. Let me contribute something to you from my experience of decades as an engineer for NASA, which is that a way to get ahead in that field is to be outspoken is to ask the stupid, obvious questions. Uh, and in any meeting, I am usually the one raising my hand going, excuse me, I don't understand this. I have a really fundamental question, something like, why are we doing this? Or who are we doing this for? And that has never <laughs> gone wrong. That, and, and the number of times that asking those questions because I don't understand who we're doing it for or why we're doing it. And the answer turns out to be, we didn't think about that. I'm not sure that's a good question. Is A, very valuable to any engineering project to make sure that it's on a sound path and B, very uh, career enhancing. So that's a good habit to develop because you can ask that question no matter how new you are to any team, you can look at things like that. And even if it's a question that does have an obvious answer and you just happen to miss it and everyone goes, oh, well, sorry, we didn't explain that here. You're the new person, you're in entitled to that. And, oh, and so someone said, uh, Ellen, hear me. Uh, what was my biggest challenge while being an engineer? And because as an engineer, I have, uh, and I didn't understand this until relatively recently, a degree of Asperger's syndrome, uh, autism spectrum, right? Um, until I did work, as I, I uh, said, with people, with um, learning things like neurolinguistic programming and a lot of work on just uh, uh, myself, uh, understanding myself, I was looking at the world through a narrow viewpoint and not knowing that. Uh, and and so I, when things went wrong with the project due to those larger issues, I didn't understand why. 
and, and I thought that the people I was dealing with were stupid or wrong because I weren't able to, wasn't able to see the issues that were outside of engineering. So that was my biggest challenge. It may not apply to, to you, but that was, was my biggest challenge. And I was lucky enough to solve it by uh, undertaking that personal work. I don't know whether that's a, a factor that applies to any of you, but your question was about me. I think that's all questions. So thank you very much, Peter. It was a great talk. Thank you. I totally uh, in, enjoy being here. And uh, feel free to ask me questions that come up later, because one of the other things that would come up um, for me as an engineer was that I would think of a question afterwards in the hallway, right? We, it happens to so many people, we call them hallway questions. So if you have a hallway question, something that comes up afterwards, afterwards then you can reach me there um, at uh, that address. And uh, uh, if you want to hear more of me and uh, smarter people that I get to talk to, that is my podcast where every week we uh, talk to people about artificial intelligence from different dimensions. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice rest of your day. You too. Bye.